There is nothing sadder than a politician out of office. They don't know what to do. They're <laughs> calling the suicide hotline. It's a terrible thing. Sean Mitchell, former state senator, former state representative, former man in power, <laughs> now just among the walking dead. John, I'm pretty happy to be out of office. When January, they went back to the Capitol, and I stayed home, and it felt great. They all, they all say that. They all say, hey, you've been writing for townhall.com, and you're getting some really sizable readership. That's kind of fun. It is fun. Uh, you know, kind of a privilege to have a voice and uh, sound off on issues. Thanks for mentioning. And now, you get to go have a job being a lawyer. I don't know how you were able to do a lawyer's job half, half year. I mean, one, I think you're probably a really bad lawyer, but two, you know, to be able to turn it off for five months while you're while you're in session, that's just got to be brutal. It's hard. Being in the legislature is supposed to be a part-time job, and it's certainly part-time pay, but it, it's a juggling act, and there are year-round demands. And it, I, I think they should. Uh, it, it's not a popular uh, conservative position, but I think they should pay state lawmakers a little more. I I, I would pay them a lot more if they would work a lot less. I, I agree with that. We should also shorten the session. And what, is it, what is it that Texas has? They have a 90-day session every other year. And Texas is a big, prosperous state. It, it works for them. Why can't it work for us? Right, let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, executive authority. We're seeing what, what the president is pulling when it comes to uh, firearms. There's a lot of work going on in the state house. You've got more experience than most in how that works and what executive power looks like. Let's go, yeah. go to the top side. You, you've seen what the, what the president has done. Give me your quick thoughts first. I'm going to, and we're going to talk about tyranny from the White House, but I'm going to depart from the script for a minute and say your, your last guest, Rudy Zidi, who, oh, yeah. who's fighting uh, uh, you know, cronyism and local government seizing property to give it to big developers. A dozen years ago, when I was pretty new in the state house, I uh, sponsored a bill to try and stop that. I uh, introduced a bill that said government can't take private property and give it to developers. The only way you can do eminent domain is for public ownership, like a road or a school. It was popular. The people liked it. Uh, of course, government hated it. Economic developers hated it. But you know who the final piece of the coalition was that helped uh, neuter my bill and water it down to... to not very significant. I give. Builders and developers. You would think they would have been on my side, property rights, protect free enterprise, but they wanted in on the opportunities. If they, if they could knock mom and, pop and, mom and pop in the bicycle shop off the block, they wanted government to give them the property. In Colorado, if I understand it right, and I could have this number wrong by a, a little bit, something like only four states, only four or five states haven't put in their own reforms against the Kelo decision. In other words, only four states haven't passed something to stop this practice of stealing people's property from government and just giving it to some other private owner. Yeah. Well, to be fair, Colorado passed a few more uh, tightening up reforms, but the, the practice is still out there and local government still do it. We, it it's uh, as corrupt and unsavory as you described. Uh, but on the bright side, there's only 3,300 governments in Colorado, so it's not like there's a <laughs> lot of chances for abuse. There you Talk go. to me about guns. You, you, this is something that's, that's hot. The, yeah. the president finally gave out his recommendations, 23 uh, executive, executive orders. Actions. Executive actions. Yeah. What is yeah. an executive action? What is an executive order? Where does the power from that come? You know, that, that's an interesting question. I, I'm not clear on the nuance between executive orders order and executive action. I'm a strong supporter of the right to bear arms, but I'm not real avid on the gun details. What I am watching closely is that our rights as citizens are protected and that the president doesn't think he can just make up the law. So when he said, I'm going to propose reforms and new restrictions, and if Congress doesn't act, I'm going to do it by executive order, uh, that set off my alarms. Every, every school kid learns that the legislature makes the law and the executive enforces the law. And I posted some angry rant on Facebook, Mr. President, if you try and regulate what I can own or what I can buy, I'm going to defy you. Um, it turns out this is... By the way, you can get disbarred for that now. <laughs> it's, a, it's not nice to shake your fist at the king. Um, you know what? His proposals are not overreaching. I mean, they're bad policy. The gun control is bad policy. But... The president is entitled to direct the executive branch. He's not entitled to regulate what you can do as a citizen, what I can do as a citizen, and that's what it sounded like he was going to do, but he didn't. 23 pretty bland recommendations, studies on gun violence, making executive branches, agencies talk to each other better. Um, he, he didn't try and control your freedom or my freedom. 
uh, there, there are a few open-ended proposals. He's going to tighten up some regulations, and we got to see what the final uh, issues will be. But in this case, I think he dangled some bait to tease conservatives. I'm going to be a king, and and he actually didn't do it. But here's part of part of the bureaucracy that that worries me because I don't think people quite understand it. Yes, I remember from Mrs. Ronaldo's class at St. Mary's in eighth grade, I still have nightmares, Mrs. Ronaldo, that the Congress makes the laws, the president can veto or sign them into law, but he runs what the, what the laws say. He uh, is the executive of the machinery. So they make laws, but they don't make rules. Same thing here in Colorado government. And so the rules are made by bureaucrats and the EPA and OSHA and the Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Division. I mean, all these people make rules that change our lives. And in that way, doesn't the executive branch have this massive amount of power? You look at the federal codes, the rule book, and it is massive. Yeah, so, you know, 30, 40 years ago, they come up with the EPA. What, what a nice thing. And now you, 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 can't, you can't buy a faucet because of right. what the EPA says. Right. Yeah, that, that's an important point. You're right, Congress passes laws, but then those laws get expanded greatly by all the rules and regulations that the executive branch passes. In theory, the regulations have to conform to or implement the policy that Congress passed, but Congress is made up of politicians. They don't like to be responsible for tough decisions, so they pass vague laws that sound good. The Americans with Disabilities Act says, let's, let's protect people's opportunity to participate in society, and then it's the regulators that really fill in the details. So. Yeah. I mean, think, yeah. Think of the, the Keystone Pipeline. Here is something where we're an energy starved nation. Here's something that keeps uh, uh, oil flowing to us from uh, Canada all the way down to Mexico. It keeps that uh, oil from going offshore to, to China and other places. So, therefore, we're going to be having a lot less pollution because it's not going to be transported. He, one man, said no. Even though it went through all the processes, even though he did all this stuff, it wasn't an act of Congress, it was an act of the bureaucracy, the executive branch. Is that an executive order? Is it an executive decision? Is it one of his cabinet heads going, what do you want me to do? That's a lot of power, and that's not rooted in Congress, it's rooted in one man. Uh, that's a great example, because not only is it uh, the, power, the power to approve or veto a project, but what's really ridiculous about the Keystone decision is it wasn't an environmental or land use decision, it was a State Department decision, supposedly on you know, national security and geopolitical concerns. But of course, it was just the president uh, appeasing his extreme environmental base and uh, sticking it to the oil and gas industry. He wanted and, to keep his Hollywood dollars flowing. And surprisingly, the unions. He stuck it to the unions. Yes. They wanted that because they wanted the work. I tell you what, bring it from D.C. here to Colorado, where you've had now, was it 16 years? Have you been in? 14. I, 14. Was, I was six years in the House, eight years in the State Senate. It was about time you got a frickin' real job. I, know. I grew old and poor, and my <laughs> kids grew up while I was yeah, in the legislature. Is it? Is it the same here in Colorado? I mean, you have the state legislature, which puts together laws, but there's still lots of organizations, Department of Health, Department of Wildlife, Department of whatever, and they make rules. They have lots of hearings. They take up a lot of people's time. But sooner or later, doesn't it boil up to the position of governor, and doesn't he have a lot of say in the same, in the same way? Interesting question. It's the same kind of uh, uh, handoff from the legislature to the regulators, but often the regulators are running their own empires and, and the governor may not be that interested in it. I, I had experience with a, uh, a bill that passed regarding liquor wholesaling and retailing and then by the time it got handed to the regulator, uh, the, the rules that were proposed were just opposite of what the legislature had intended. And that wasn't a governor issue, that was just a, a little regulator running her system. It's, it's a staff issue. Yeah. So well, what, do you, what do you do about something like that? I mean, if um, it, because the law says this, mm -hmm. but the power is in the bureaucrats. And I don't mean bureaucrats in a, a derogatory way. These are the people who run the machinery. The authorized regulators. Right. right. And they're the ones who come up with rules. And often those rules, that's yeah. not the first time, 
are very opposite to what the intent was behind the, the law that created those rules. There are two or three checkpoints where you're supposed to be able to stop that kind of uh, abuse. Number one, the rules have to be approved by the legislature, actually. They, they're effective for one year only, and the legislature, the Legal Services Committee, votes whether or not to renew the rules. If an abusive rule slips through that checkpoint... So un uh, unlike the feds, Colorado has at least a safety valve a year later that in order for those rules to become standard and, and to keep going, uh, the legislature, the full legislature or just this one committee? Um, has both. To, has the, to the committee makes the recommendation and then pa it's called the rule review bill and it's a, a development from the years of divided government when there were, Colorado had Democratic governors and a Republican legislature and the legislature... Oh, the glory days. <laughs> exactly. Uh, some, some of the legislators didn't like the, the regulatory agencies just running wild, so they created this process. And the Le Legal Services Committee reviews rules and then says, yeah, thumbs up, thumbs down, and then gives it to the full legislature to, to confirm that decision. All right. That doesn't work. What happens next? Well, then if you're a business and a regulator brings some enforcement action against you, you and you think, that's outrageous, that's not what the law says, you have to hire a lawyer and you have to fight it. But you can't do that. I mean, we're talking about mom and pop businesses. They can barely make their own damn payroll in order to pay somebody 300, what are you lawyers making these days? $500 uh, thousands of dollars, dollars an, an hour. hour. Yes, yes. You know, it, it just can't be done. So there, there's, a, there's a lot of intimidation that I think people who aren't in small business don't understand with regulators, not the lawmakers, but the guys who interpret those laws. How long do we have, John? You've got a minute. You've got oh, a half right. a minute. I'm going to talk fast. Um, you, you're right. That, that, that They can't afford to fight an unreasonable decision. It costs more than, than what's at stake. And also, they can't afford to jeopardize their relationship with the regulator. If I push back on this, you're just going to come back and punish me another way. It's a bad situation a lot of times. Yeah. 14 years in government, and you weren't able to fix it. What I good tried. are you? Yeah. Hey, thank you so much. Again, townhall.com. Look for uh, Sean Mitchell's work there. Look for me. Actually, listen for me on KHOW Radio on Sunday afternoons. Check out the end Independence Institute, that's independenceinstitute.org. Tell a friend about Devil's Advocate, send me $20, and we'll see you next week.